Oops, so I will just talk a little bit until everyone is in. Ja, normalerweise dauert das immer ein bisschen, bis alle Zuschauer so langsam aber sicher eingetrudelt sind. Darum warten wir noch kurz. So, we're now up until up 24 people. Let's see if more are coming. I'll retweet my tweet from yesterday and see if that helps. Okay. So, isn't it? Ich fang, ich fang jetzt einfach mal an. So, I will start um, now. Just for everyone who is speaking English, I will start an introduction in German. But don't worry, the main part of the discussion later on is uh, in English. So, um, yeah, you can look forward to that. Um, Grüß Gott, herzlich willkommen und ähm, viele Grüße hier aus Baden-Württemberg. Ich bin Daniel Schmidt, ich bin Programmmanager der Friedrich-Hinaumann-Stiftung und darf Sie heute hier in unserem Online-Web-Talk begrüßen. Ähm, ja, das, der Titel ist Blurring Lines, Presse- und Medienfreiheit unter Druck. Äh, ich werde jetzt kurz etwas zur Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung sagen und dann an die, unsere Moderatorin übergeben, die unsere zwei Referenten vorstellt. Ich freue mich, dass Sie alle heute Abend hier sind und freue mich auf eine interessante Veranstaltung. Wie gesagt, zunächst darf ich etwas zur Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung und zur Reinhold-Meyer-Stiftung sagen. Das hier ist das Logo der Reinhold-Meyer-Stiftung, weil manche bei so Veranstaltungen schon gedacht haben, ich werde Reinhold-Meyer. Das bin ich aber nicht, wie gesagt. Ähm, Seit mehr als 60 Jahren betreibt die Friedrich-Naumann-Stiftung politische Bildung im Auftrag der Freiheit im Inland sowie in über 60 Ländern der Welt. Sie setzt sich für die Stärkung von Demokratie, Rechtsstaatlichkeit und Menschenrechten ein. In Baden-Württemberg arbeitet sie dabei eng mit der Reinhold-Meyer-Stiftung als liberale Landesstiftung zusammen, die mit ihrer Arbeit an die besondere Tradition und Programmatik des Südwestliberalismus erinnert. Neben der Förderung von jungen Wissenschaftlern und der Erforschung des Liberalismus als politischer Idee ist die Bildungsarbeit die Hauptaufgabe der Stiftung. Die Arbeitsschwerpunkte sind dabei die Ver Veranstaltungen zur offenen Gesellschaft, Digitalisierung, soziale Marktwirtschaft, Bildungs- und Kulturpolitik und die Zukunft der europäischen Integration, die von der Theodor-Heuss-Akademie, dem Bundesprogramm und den Landesbüros organisiert werden. Viel, sehr herzlich bedanken darf ich mich bei unserem heutigen Kooperationspartner der Deutschen Gesellschaft für Auswärtige Politik und in dem Zusammenhang natürlich bei unserer Moderatorin Caroline Gill, die ich auch kurz vorstellen möchte. Caroline studierte Kulturwissenschaften, Ost- und Südosteuropawissenschaften und Polonistik an der Uni Leipzig, an der Uni Krakau und an der Pariser Sorbonne. Sie leitet den Bereich Integration und Medien am Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen in Stuttgart, und ist Co-Vorsitzende des Regionalforums Baden-Württemberg der Deutschen Gesellschaft für Auswärtige Politik. Gerne darf ich Sie, liebe Teilnehmer, auch auf den YouTube-Kanal von Caroline Gill hinweisen mit dem Namen Caroline Gill. Dort gibt es Interviews über die aktuellen Veränderungen für Kultur, Gesellschaft und Außenpolitik. Gerne möchte ich Sie auch später dazu einladen, ähm, ja, sich an der Diskussion zu beteiligen, Fragen zu stellen. Sie können die Fragen über das Frage- und Antwort tun unten an Ihrem Bildschirm, sowohl auf Deutsch als auch auf Englisch stellen. Wir werden das dann weitergeben. Vielen Dank, dass Sie hier sind. Ich übergebe an Caroline und wünsche Ihnen allen viel Spaß. Yeah, good evening from Stuttgart. Welcome on my part. My name is Caroline Giel. I'm looking forward to moderate Uh, today's online discussion entitled Blurring Lines, Press and Media Freedom Under Pressure. A look at the United States and Russia with our speakers Renata Alt, member of the German Parliament, the German Bundestag with the Liberal Party FDP, and US journalist Simon Ostrovsky. It is a great pleasure to have you both with us. And of course, the audience, uh, you may be watching and listening from all over Germany or other countries. So welcome to all of you. 
Uh, our discussion will last one hour. And as you already heard, you can write questions by using the Q&A or in German, uh, the F and A function, the F and A function in Zoom. I will collect the questions and ask our experts in the second half of the discussion. You can also write in German, the questions will be translated. And on behalf of the regional forum, Baden-Württemberg of the German Council on Foreign Relations, I would also like to send you the warmest regards from our co-chair, Professor Wolfgang Schuster. We would like to thank very much the Naumann Foundation for this wonderful cooperation. And briefly about the DJP um, and our regional forum in Baden-Württemberg, we are committed to a sustainable German and European foreign and security policy that focuses on democracy, peace, and the rule of law. The DJP has shaped the foreign policy debate in Germany since 1955 as a research and membership organization. The regional forum Baden-Württemberg has recently been active again. In particular, we will offer events on foreign policy issues in Baden-Württemberg. So next event will be held on Friday with Dieter Zetsche, former Daimler CEO and Daniela Schwarzer, director of the DJP. And now uh, let me introduce our speakers. First, Renata Alt. Renata Alt was born in former Czechoslovakia. After studying chemical engineering, she worked in foreign trade and in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Prague before she came to Germany as an attaché for Czechoslovakia. She has been a member of the German Bundestag since 2017, a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Rapporteur for Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans, and Chairwoman of the Civil Crisis Prevention Subcommittee. And Simon Ostrovsky, uh, who is an outstanding journalist and documentary filmmaker based in New York. About his work, there has been Russian Roulette, the flagship Vice News series he hosted and produced when war broke out in Ukraine in 2014. It was nominated for two Emmys and went to over 100 episodes that have been viewed more than 35 million times. These days, Simon is a special correspondent at B PBS NewsHour covering both domestic and international affairs. But not everyone is obviously a fan of his work, as he's saying. Some pro-Russian militias in eastern Ukraine kidnapped Simon and kept him in cellar for three days in April 2014. Over the years, Simon Ostrovsky has worked for a lot of different outlets, including PBS, CNN, CBS, HBO, and the BBC. But he started his career in Russia and the former Soviet Union as a print reporter, where he lived for nine years. And he witnesses, witnessed the rise of Putin and covered four revolutions. So he knows both countries pretty well. Um, to our tonight's discussion, as we already heard, freedom uh, of the press and freedom of expression are coming under increasing pressure in many countries these days. The international organization Reporters Without Borders presented its ranking of press freedom in April. It shows that repressive tendencies have increased due to the corona pandemic and that the coming decade could be crucial for the future of journalism. There are growing of numbers of challenges. Authoritarian and populist tendencies are threatening democracy, targeted disinformation and fake news are increasingly influencing opinion formation. We will focus tonight on the situation in the United States and Russia. Russia is currently ranked 149th in the press freedom ranking out of 180. The US has deteriorated by three ranks compared to the previous year to 45. Simon, my first question will be addressed to you. How you would describe the differences in the media system, US versus Russia? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the panel. It's really an honor to um, be speaking to you uh, today from New York, especially with Renata Alt, who's a member of your parliament. And I'm really interested uh, to hear what she has to say. Um, and it's a really important time as well to be talking about the issue of uh, media freedom uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, because the journalists are under attack uh, in very different ways, but they definitely are under attack, uh, both in sort of former Eastern Bloc countries, in Russia, 
um, but also increasingly uh, in the United States. And so um, I look forward to this conversation that we're going to have about how journalists are under attack in different ways in these uh, different places. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin in Russia has been in power for two decades now, and there was recently a referendum um, on extending uh, his potential to stay in power until uh, 2036. So he's had a lot of time to tinker with the media system uh, in Russia, perhaps in a way that uh, no uh, other leader um, except uh, Lukashenko of Belarus, who's the only one in the former Soviet Union who's uh, been around longer than Putin has as the leader of his country, um, have been able to you know, manipulate their own media situation. So when comparing the United States uh, with Russia, that's the very first thing that you have to take into account, is that there's uh, never been a leader in the United States has been in power uh, long enough to acquire the kind of monopoly on information um, that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin has in Russia. I came to Russia as a student uh, in um, 1998 and in 1999, um, uh, Putin was uh, appointed prime minister and then became president of the country. And I started my journalistic career um, in Moscow when he started his presidential uh, career in Russia. And so I uh, witnessed in real time um, the things that he did to dismantle um, media freedoms in Russia. And if we want to generalize, then essentially that involved bringing the most influential independent media companies under the Kremlin's control and under state control through direct ownership um, as much as possible. And sort of the very first um, thing that happened in, in, in that sphere was um, the uh, attack by the Kremlin on NTV, the very popular uh, independent television network that now is uh, firmly um, pro-Putin and holds a uh, pro-Kremlin line. But there are other uh, state-owned television companies in Russia, um, like Rasia and Channel One, um, and even some of the outlets that we think of as independent, such as um, Echo of Moscow, Echo Moskvi, which is a, a liberal radio station uh, widely listened to in Russia, is also actually owned by Gazprom Media, the state-owned uh, gas monopoly. Um, and so although you, know, you do are able to hear an independent perspective on a radio station like this, there are certain lines that even that outlet uh, has to be careful uh, not to cross uh, occasionally. So I think that uh, the editor of, of that radio station, um, uh, Vinny Ziktov, knows where the boundaries are for what he can say. And all they, although you, you wouldn't be able to call what that radio station does as uh, pro-Kremlin propaganda, um, it, it's, they still have to tread a very, very fine line. Now, um, I would say probably 80, 90% of the population of Russia get their information from um, outlets that are directly controlled by the government. Um, and that's primarily uh, television stations. Um, but uh, uh, newspapers, um, which have been more independent in the past, have started uh, coming under uh, quasi-government control as well, whether that's pressure to have uh, editors fired um, and, and replaced with more loyal editors, or whether it's actually um, purchasing institutions. You, you can't really compare that kind of direct state control of the media with the situation that you have in the United States. I really think that um, the, the serious problem that American uh, media face uh, right now have more to do with market forces uh, than political pressure. And the problems that American media do face are the same problems um, that uh, unlikely your uh, viewers and listeners are familiar with in Germany, um, which is the rise of the internet and the rise of social media platforms, uh, capturing a much greater percentage of the attention span um, of the average viewer. So, you know, every person can only watch um, television or internet or listen to radio for a set number of hours a day. And the more time they're spending on social media, obviously the less time um, they're spending on the traditional media. And, you know, you might say 
something along the lines of, well, that's not necessarily bad. Some of those social media uh, present an alternative view. Um, but a lot of times it is just that. It's simply a view. And where we're losing out uh, is the traditional kind of reporting um, that uh, news organizations uh, used to be able to dedicate a lot of resources to uh, when they weren't competing um, with so many different outlets uh, that have proliferated through the inter internet, many of which are at the end of day, uh, at the end of the day, uh, basically opinion um, uh, sources and not uh, uh, sources of reporting or objective news or on the ground sort of eyewitness reports. They're regurgitating other people's work and putting their own spin on it and capturing audiences that way. And that's just hurting the bottom line um, of media companies in the United States. And, and that's why, you know, not a month goes by um, in the American media market where you don't hear about dozens of reporters uh, getting fired from uh, companies that they are working at because of financial cuts that have to be made. So um, not only is it uh, a difficult industry to work in um, for the reasons you know, that journalists sometimes face around the world in terms of doing a dangerous job, but it's also a difficult uh, industry to work in because you have zero uh, job security and you could lose your, your uh, employment at any time. So, you know- You say, Simon, that we cannot compare the situation in both countries, but what do you mean, uh, or how do you comment the title, Blurring Lines? What does it mean to you? So overall, I think like the bigger problems uh, that the American uh, media face have to do with the, with the market. But there has been a change over the last several years, also in the way that our government uh, relates to media. And there's been sort of a disturbing trend in the direction of uh, political leaders finding it um, possible to openly attack the media um, when uh, journalists or news organizations disagree with what they're saying. And of course, you know, the prime example of this is uh, the president of the United States who routinely um, uh, attacks journalists directly during press conferences or through Twitter, um, where he decries them as fake news and uh, often retweets um, accounts of people with even more radical views um, who sometimes are promoting violence uh, against uh, the journalists themselves. So that's a really big change that is sort of taking a step in the direction of uh, what a country like Russia uh, has been doing for a much, much longer time. And because we're at a very early stage uh, of uh, that process, you know, if you compare it to Russia where um, this sort of anti-media, anti-freedom of speech presidency has been around for two decades, um, here we're into our uh, third or fourth year at, at this point of, uh, a leader who faces a lot more checks and balances um, in what he can achieve. I think, you know, what the president wants to achieve in terms of controlling the media narrative, uh, there's a very different gap between what he can um, because of protections that we have in place here. But that's not to say that we haven't started moving in the wrong direction uh, in the United States. And I think that that's very significant. Um my next question would be to Renata um, Alt. What changes did you observe in the recent years and how they are related to the foreign policy um, of the country, especially in Russia? Because you just came back before Corona pandemic started from Russia. So um, perhaps you can give us some more insights. Yes, uh, first, also, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, having me uh, on the panel. Yes, um, it's uh, the state control over media has uh, been uh, uh, growing continually under under, under Putin. Uh, he has been continually uh, expanding state control over media since he came into power. Uh, in fact, um, one of his first actions uh, after he came into power was uh, changing uh, the editorial team of the super popular and uh, TV channel. In uh, recent years, uh, after the annexation of Crimea, uh, pressure on, uh, on media has been uh, continually growing uh, ever more. 
um, Russia median landscape um, at the moment is deeply divided uh, between the almost completely state controlled television broadcasting, uh, some more or less uh, independent radio and uh, printed, pre printed press channels and a uh, huge uh, diversity of uh, online media. Um, we can uh, uh, observe uh, so observe half how especially recently independent journalists have been put uh, under uh, tremendous uh, pressure. Um, two days uh, ago, uh, Svetlana Prokopieva has been charged uh, with a, a huge fee uh, de facto for criticizing FSB, uh, Russian security services. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sergei Safronov was uh, charged with uh, treason. Uh, last year, Ivan Golunov uh, was uh, unlawfully uh, prosecuted. Uh, the list um, can go on uh, and on. And uh, I'm not uh, talking about uh, the stark examples like uh, killing of Anna Politkovskaya. Majority Rus Russian are watching TV um, which uh, communicated hardcore propaganda. Uh, it is um, important to note uh, that the quality of this propaganda is getting worse. And uh, the TV is uh, spreading more and more outright lies. Um. My question to um, to Simon, um, because you said that um, in the U.S. and during the um, during President Donald Trump's term in office, um, you are just in the fourth and five years. So you mean that it will develop the way how it is in in Russia? Can you turn off your microphone? I'm not saying that it's necessarily going to uh, go in the direction uh, of Russia. We have to wait and see um, uh, whether you know these processes will be allowed to uh, continue. I think it really depends on how the American public uh, reacts to these pressures on the media. Um, and you know we have some very robust protections for the freedom of speech in the United States. Um, because of the First Amendment, which is upheld here almost like a tenant of, uh, like a commandment practically. Um, and so, you know, different people interpret it differently. But I'm actually working on a story right now that's uh, looking at some of the protections that the First Amendment offers through the lens of um, uh, how the federal authorities can counter uh, domestic versus international terrorism. So the story I'm working on for NewsHour at the moment um, looks at this concept of material support, where you have a list of terrorist organizations that exist um, uh, sanctioned by the State Department, or rather banned by the State Department, um, where there are groups like ISIS uh, and, or Al-Qaeda, for example. And if you declare support for an organization like that, um, then you uh, are breaking the law. And I think similar laws exist uh, about extremism in, in Germany. But the difference on the domestic terrorism side is that there is no list of uh, domestic terrorist organizations, although a lot of people would like to see groups like the KKK declared uh, as terrorists. However, if you go online or you know into a public square and say you are a member of the KKK or you support the KKK, um, then uh, nothing will happen to you. And when you compare that to the treatment of somebody who declared support for ISIS, somebody who declared support for the KKK, then it's a completely and totally different uh, approach. And so this is, you know, part of the big debate um, that we're having right now about the freedom of speech uh, in the United States, about whether that is a, a fair system or not. Um, because on the one hand, you know, why is white supremacy considered to be less of a threat um, from a legal point of view when uh, right-wing radicals have killed more people in the United States in the last five years um, than Islamist terrorists? Um, but on the other hand, once you start declaring groups, once it becomes possible to start declaring groups in the United States as banned organizations, you can move swiftly from the KKK to a movement like Black Lives Matter or um, Antifa. 
And we've seen uh, the president already uh, tweet that he would like to see um, Antifa declared um, a terrorist group, although we don't even have, as I said, uh, a list of domestic terrorist organizations. So that's just sort of a, a way of saying that I think because these kinds of debates in the United States are really robust and they extend beyond the public debate into the court system, um, these, you know, these protections are actually real, um, that we're really far away from uh, getting to the point where Russia is right now in 2020. However, we've also seen um, you know, a protest movement sweep the United States in the last few weeks. And I've been covering um, the protests from New York. Um, so you know, I have a perspective that is potentially not applicable to the entire country because the situation is different in every city. Um, but I have been in situations here in the city that have been pretty tense for journalists, and I'm aware of at least a couple of arrests of journalists. So have you been, have you yourself or your colleagues uh, have encountered censorship or restrictions? Because we heard uh, from Renata Alt, she named some famous journalists in, in, in Russia, but you yourself in, in being and working right now in the United States. Personally, I haven't faced what you could call censorship. Um, I think the problem for many journalists covering this national story that's still unfolding in front of our eyes is uh, uh, part of the story um, that's unfolding before our eyes. Because again, these are protests against uh, police violence um, and police brutality uh, to a large extent. And the police in dealing with uh, the journalists who are covering these events often exhibit the same practices that they direct against the um, uh, protesters. And so, especially in Minneapolis, which was sort of the center of this uh, movement where um, sparked by the killing of uh, George Floyd by the Minneapolis police, um, the police have been extremely violent as it relates to journalism. So do we call that censorship? I mean, not necessarily, but if the police are shooting out the eye of a freelance reporter with a non-lethal weapon, um, then that really impedes her ability to continue reporting um, on the situation that she's uh, witnessing, right? And so um, there have been a several incidents like that in Minneapolis. A friend of mine, uh, Ed O, who's a reporter for NBC, um, was uh, seemingly deliberately uh, tear gassed and then beaten, although he was wearing um, you know, all kinds of markings for, for press and he said he was press and he has to be, uh, he has to be helped and wasn't helped. And, you know, when you watch the video, it's quite sh shocking um, to see the police come right up to him, spray him in the face and then tackle him as if, uh, you know, they were uh, clearing the scene of somebody who was committing a uh, terrible crime. I mean, so, you know, when you do see videos shared around on the internet like that, it makes your blood boil and it makes you anger, angry and it makes you think, well, you know, what direction is our country heading in? Um, but you do have to temper that with the fact that these incidents, for the most part, are now going to be dealt with uh, in court. So there are several ongoing lawsuits against uh, the Minneapolis uh, uh, Police Department to do with these attacks against journalists, which haven't resolved yet but could result in potentially uh, big payouts to the uh, injured victims, which would go towards hopefully, you know, staying the hand of police in future incidents, um, but also provide, you know, some level of justice to the people, to the journalists who were hurt. Now, there was a journalist in Moscow just a few days ago who was uh, reporting on um, the uh, referendum uh, on changing the constitution and police officers broke his arms. His, one of his arms. I saw the, the um, x-ray um, and it was a really bad break. I mean, like clear through, you can see space between the bones. It's terrible. Um, no investigation has been opened into the police officers uh, who have done that. So, you know, another really big uh, difference is one of accountability. Do bad things happen uh, in the United States and in Russia? Yes. Is there more accountability in the United States um, uh, than there is in Russia, obviously. There's other countries where there's more accountability than there is in the United States, but comparing it to Russia is obviously setting a pretty low bar. Um, Mrs. Alt, um, you were mentioning the, the state-controlled media, but which islands of freedom you see in Russia? Are they islands of freedom um, and independent media? 
Yes, uh, uh, despite uh, several um, operations, uh, Russian media landscape, landscape, especially in the internet, is uh, thriving. Uh, there are um, individual cases of very brave and uh, independent small local media, uh, but uh, get they uh, oppressed as uh, soon as they become bigger and more prominent as uh, it was uh, the case with uh, the TV2 channel in Tomsk. Uh, Russia uh, experiences uh, freedom of speech uh, on the internet. Uh, there are um, examples of uh, brilliant, small, low, uh, low, low budget, uh, but uh, independent uh, and uh, very good media like TV Rain. Um, but uh, the spaces of freedom are shrinking and uh, the trend is twofold. Um, one of the, uh, on, on the, on the one hand, Russia's independent media are moving abroad. Uh, there are channels like Nestoyace Vremia broadcasting uh, from Prague, uh, Ostwest TV uh, sitting in Berlin, uh, RTV uh, with a major seat in New York and uh, the news webpage uh, Medusa in Riga. They are registered media which uh, broadcast mostly uh, on the internet uh, in Russian. Alongside um, Western sponsored media like uh, Deutsche Welle or Radio, Radio Free Europe, they become uh, the refugee for brilliant Russian journalists uh, who cannot uh, remain um, in, in Russia. Uh, the other trend uh, is that more and more journalists and uh, liberal politicians uh, become bloggers uh, as they lose access to media. Uh, they have experiences, uh, knowledges, and uh, know-how uh, of making, of uh, producing uh, good, rep good reporting. Uh, and so they just start uh, their own small media business uh, on YouTube. This gives uh, them a uh, little tiny more freedom. Simon, uh, how you would comment on that? Which role is playing YouTube um, and other platforms like uh, like Twitter in the US? Well, I think it's interesting, especially when you're looking at it, uh, comparing it to the Russian situation. Why? Because uh, in Russia, you know, a lot of these independent actors, independent journalists, commentators who have large followings um, on the internet are a breath of fresh air for the Russian public because they're an alternative to um, the state uh, uh, controlled media that they access. When can, they you turn name, on can you name some? Can you name some channels? Some YouTube channels? It's worth to have a look at. Well, there's one. Uh, uh, I guess you would call host or presenter of a YouTube channel. His name is Yuri Dudes. He's very popular. Um, in, in Russia at the moment, he has millions of followers and subscribers, and uh, he does provide an alternative view to what you can get when you're watching TV in Russia. Um, and he focuses on issues that the, that the government would prefer that the public didn't think about at all. And he is, uh, you know, a counterweight to what is actually a genuinely repressive media environment. It's very different in the United States um, because in the United States, there's a oversaturation of uh, information. There is no, uh, let's say, banning of the freedom of speech in a major way as such. But a lot of the commentators that you get on YouTube and on Twitter uh, like to present themselves uh, as though they are giving you an alternative opinion to the mainstream media um, which is the, their equivalent of, you know, repressive tyranny. Um, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is that while that space in the United States is growing, the space of opinion makers on YouTube um, and on Twitter and what have you, there's tons of new platforms, um, the space for original reporting 
is shrinking. And I think a lot of uh, consumers of media um, don't understand the difference between uh, reporting um, and, uh, you know, sitting at home and talking into a microphone um, about the events that you've read online and then, and then providing a spin or an angle on them. Um, and what we're losing here in the United States and why the quality of uh, broadcast media and journalism is going down is the fact that we're losing the resources um, to, cut, to, to send journalists to actual places to witness actual events and tell us what's happening. And what we're getting more of is people telling us about what they think is happening. Um, and sort of that passes as uh, alternative media and an alternative point of view. Well, I would like to see uh, more journalism in the United States and, 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 and more broadly, that is, um, that is actual reporting of events um, rather than opinion uh, about the events. Um, Mrs. Alt, um, you named um, some, also some YouTube channels and um, named them as um, Isles of Freedom. Uh, but how the state, um, um, how, how the government or how Putin, how the Kremlin uh, can restrict these platforms? What is dangerous uh, there for the journalists? Or Simon, if you if you have some uh, some um, answer to that question, of course you also can take the question. How you can how can you restrict the platforms like YouTube? How can you perhaps stop uh, these people like the the independent journalists like Yuri Dude? Well, you can you can uh, you can stop them uh, directly. Um, by blocking websites, um, or you can stop them, and this is more often the case, um, by just in inundating the information space with uh, lots of your own content. Um, and so that, you know, people get uh, lost in the swamp of information and it's difficult for the person to sort of raise their head above the parapet so, and, and to get noticed. Um, yeah, I think there's, rather few websites that are blocked wholesale in Russia. I mean, LinkedIn, which isn't a media site, it's more of a social networking professional site, is blocked in Russia because they refuse to share um, their uh, users' personal data with the government. Um, but YouTube isn't blocked uh, in Russia. And so you can, uh, or Instagram, and a lot of young people are getting their um, their, their content from uh, Instagram uh, rather than YouTube. So, um, and that's very popular uh, in, in Russia at the moment. Um, so I think there's other countries, you know, that use the blocking uh, of, of websites wholesale much more robustly than Russia does as a tactic, like Turkey, for example, um, which I believe has blocked Facebook and YouTube for a very long time now. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, and then of course, China, which is the prime example of a country which um, blocks anything and everything uh, that they don't like. Russia's strategy is a little bit more subtle uh, in, in, in that they're really trying to produce their own extremely inaccurate but entertaining content um, that's going to uh, attract people uh, and pull them away uh, from these alternative voices that we have out there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, Renato agrees or has something to add to that. Yes, uh, I am. Uh, it's uh, I'm the same meaning. I, I think uh, Vladimir Putin can um, stop uh, the uh, um, home pages or, or the blogger, um, but it's uh, very important to know um, the majority of Russia, Russians. Uh, are using not Facebook, but home ground social media, uh, which are state controlled. Um, international, internationally, it is also not only the notoriously uh, known Russia Today and uh, rapidly, but uh, diverse social media uh, accounts. Uh, so um, uh, Putin uh, has the possibility um, uh, to, to block uh, ab abrupt uh, this uh, blogger. 
I think that's a really good point because uh, the social media platforms that are most popular in Russia, as you say, they're platforms like VK.com or Adnaklasniki, which is now called OK.com or .ru. And, um, you know, most Russians are on them. So there's really no need to block Facebook uh, or YouTube when you've got most of your uh, citizenry using the homegrown um, social networking websites in one way or the other. So I think you're exactly right about that. I want to bring in also the audience, so I highly encourage you to write and send us questions to our speakers, and we're waiting for them. But in the meantime, uh, another um, question to, to Mrs. Alt, because you criticized um, criticized the Russian, the, the Kremlin, um, but what does it mean for you as a politician? Um, uh, which options are there for action um, uh, for Germany? Um, for me, it's a very, uh, um, very important um, to uh, see the uh, disinformation uh, from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, Russia use uh, a lot of disinformation and uh, propaganda domestically and internationally. Uh, major narrative uh, are the inability of, of the West to face uh, its problems and uh, its weakness and uh, its uh, bias uh, towards Russia uh, on the uh, one hand and Russia's uh, adherence uh, to traditional values, its strengths on the other. And um, it's... Um, um, important for us um, to, uh, to show um, it's, it's, uh, it's not true uh, what, uh, what the uh, Russian people uh, see uh, in the media. So um, on the uh, domestic Russian propaganda treats Western countries as uh, weak losers and many so-called journalists, uh, even three and Western uh, countries, this uh, use uh, of power. And um, it's uh, important, uh, for example, with Deutsche Welle, uh, um, so then Russian news, YouTube channels um, can, can help um, subscribe really uh, situation in the West, in Western or also in Germany. But what does it mean like in concrete um, uh, for, for Germany? How uh, can we support independent media? Um, at first, um, we have to keep uh, naming and shaming. Uh, every time Russian media lie, uh, especially about uh, our countries in Europe, uh, we have to uh, explicitly criticize that. I do that on Twitter, uh, maybe every day. Uh, to uh, the, the so-called um, Lisa case, when Russia media uh, lied about, uh, about uh, a Russian uh, girl, uh, being gripped uh, by a refugee is uh, the most prominent case. Um, but there are many small lies uh, spread by Russians propaganda here and domestically. We have to call um, very loud uh, every time and, uh, a case of prop propaganda lies um, is uh, revealed. We also need um, maybe a new uh, Magnitsky uh, act for Europe uh, in order to be uh, to be uh, able to to ban managers uh, of Russian media uh, that hinder freedom of speech um, from traveling to Europe and uh, holding assets uh, here. Um, one of the major uh, mouthpieces of propaganda, Vladimir Soloviev, uh, has a huge house uh, in Italy uh, at the Garda Lake. I guess um, he would think uh, twice um, what he says uh, if they knew uh, that he risks being banned uh, from traveling to Italy. Uh, so second, uh, providing access uh, to good journalists uh, 
education for representative of the still existing free media uh, I have named um, scholarships, uh, in internships, um, Deutsche Welle are super important as uh, the, uh, the school of good journalism is uh, getting lost in Russia because the demand uh, is for propaganda and uh, not for good journalism. There is a reporting network on Eastern Europe, Europe called now uh, um, near us. They are also educating Eastern European journalists. We need more people and uh, NGOs uh, like them. Simon, what uh, would uh, um, what uh, from your point of view would be the suggestion for uh, politicians uh, protecting um, human rights and liberal values? Well, my suggestion is going to be a little bit self-serving um, because uh, I work for a public broadcaster, or rather I work with a public broadcaster um, that only gets around 14% of its uh, funding from the government uh, and is routinely uh, attacked for that reason. And uh, they're essentially uh, certainly supporters in this administration of cutting even that meager amount of uh, funding for public broadcasters. But there's public radio in this country and other uh, uh, public information suppliers that also get a trickle of money uh, from the federal government the and local governments. And the local, the rest of the um, uh, their sources of funding primarily come from donations, from members of the public and from foundations. Um, and uh, I think that there have been a lot of media companies that have over the years said um, that they can provide groundbreaking journalism regularly um, through market-based forces. Uh, and many have tried and many, uh, as we're seeing now under the current circumstances are failing uh, to do that in a, in a regular, you know, on a regular basis um, in a consistent way. And so what we're seeing more of, even with channels like, um, you know, CNN or uh, MSNBC, which are totally co uh, commercial enterprises, uh, is that uh, the amount of actual reporting that is happening on those channels is being, and Fox News, I should say, um, is being pushed out um, by commentators uh, who are competing with the commentators that we get on the internet, on the social media platforms. And so it, it's becoming less and less commercially viable to provide a sort of balanced, calm, steady, uh, factual, uh, objective news because you have to compete with all of these op opinions which are a lot cheaper to produce and a lot more exciting to listen to. And if we want to be able to have um, the kind of uh, news reporting um, that we believe is important to retaining uh, our democratic system that uh, checks the actions uh, of the government and other bad actors, whether they be corporate uh, or criminal, um, then we need to put our money um, where our hopes are. You know, if, if we want to have good media, we have to pay for it. And there's different ways of paying for it. One of them could be, uh, you know, more funding for public broadcasters along the lines of the way the BBC is run. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially there's a, a, a large public broadcaster in Germany as well um, that you're more familiar with than I am um, that does the same thing. Uh, let me bring some questions um, into our discussions. Um, uh, the first question, if a post-Putinist Russia chooses a democratic path, how should the Russian society then deal with the remaining Putinist propagandists who propagated violence and hate? Simon, what do you think? Sorry, could you repeat the beginning of the question? Um, in the post-Putinist Russia, if Russia chooses um, in future uh, a democratic path, how the remaining Putinist propagandists, um, um, yeah, how the Russian society should then deal with them? Well, it's uh, it's a really fantastical question in, in the sense that um, I don't think that that's a tomorrow problem. That's like a day after tomorrow problem, or maybe like a, the decade after tomorrow problem. Um, you know, I, I don't think thinking about how we're going to uh, deal with supporters of the Putin regime um, is the best way of bringing about democracy uh, in Russia. And I'm certainly not gonna advocate 
um, for uh, retribution um, of any kind uh, right now. I, you know, I really think it's up to the uh, Russian people to decide how they're going to uh, deal with it. But, you know, having said that, Russia has always had a problem with uh, not reckoning with its past and sweeping past problems uh, under the under the carpet and that resulting in, um, you know, history repeating itself and mistakes being repeated. And uh, Germany has gone through an excruciating process of picking over its history with a microscope and uh, investigating every uh, little thing that has happened in its totalitarian past in order to uh, uh, avoid repeating that totalitarian past. Um, that is a process that began in the 1990s uh, under Yeltsin, um, but was quickly stopped uh, when Putin came to power. And so, you know, in, in a theoretical post-Putin era, um, I would hope that there would be some kind of truth and reconciliation um, looking into both the excesses of the Putin era um, as well as uh, uh, the excesses of uh, Russia's past more generally, which still to this day um, haven't been uh, digested by uh, large swathes of the society. And another question, uh, is it possible to say that there is current Russian influence on the media of the US and on the topics dealt with in the media in much the same way that there was direct influence on various Western elections? Also, Mrs. Alt, if you want to answer, uh, just let us know. Mm, I, I don't believe in uh, influence uh, of uh, USA in uh, Russia uh, TV. Um, um. The question was, is there current Russian influence on the media of the US and the topics? Simon, you, you know more about that? I think there's more influence uh, on social media um, than there is sort of on um, traditional media organizations, television stations, uh, newspapers, um, you know, Russian influence is there where it's difficult to, uh, or where it's easy rather to hide your, your presence. So if you can create dozens and hundreds of sock puppet accounts on Twitter, that's an area where it's easy for um, uh, Russia and other countries, even other interested parties um, uh, to be. But I don't think that Russia has any kind of direct influence over, you know, a newspaper like the New York Times or, um, or, or even an outlet like Fox News. I just don't see like how that mechanism would work. I mean, do you, ha does the person send any examples that they're asking about specifically? Not yet, but perhaps the person will send some examples. So I'm, I, I can ask again. again. Um, Another question, uh, actually two, concerning Russia. How popular is government-controlled reporting in the internet compared to the independent reporting? And second, are the younger generations in Russia more critical about media coverage um, steered by the government? Who's that one for? It's not addressed. Uh, it's to both of you. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer briefly about uh, young people. They're very similar in Russia um, to the young people here in the United States, and they get uh, their content from, uh, you know, social media more than anywhere. So if they are seeing mainstream uh, media, for, for the most part, they're getting it in sort of clips and, and memes that are being shared on social media. And uh, I think very few uh, Russians or uh, young Russians, um, you know, watch the evening news broadcast with the same enthusiasm as their parents or grandparents once did. Um, Mrs. Um, I, I don't know if you want to add or answer. Um, I just uh, want to bring some uh, some figures. Um, Simon, you mentioned uh, the YouTube channel uh, of Yuri Dud, so he got 
uh, like um, regularly 10 million, 10 million clicks um, on YouTube. There are also other very popular and famous journalists who also, um, yeah, if they post something, so get, they get that size uh, of, of, of clicks and uh, views. And there are current polls um, that say that 53% of the young generation in Russia, they actually want to leave the country. So um, perhaps, uh, Mrs. Alt, you have uh, some information. You just visited Russia um, and you met uh, also civil society organization. Perhaps um, you, you got some other impression or the same impression. I have the same impression, but um, we we met uh, uh, NGO Memorial, so uh, uh, no other civilian uh, organization. Uh, so I, I can't tell you more. About right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, got yet the example of the, the second question. We're still waiting for that. It was about the current Russian influence uh, on the media and the topics dealt with. So uh, once I will see it, I will I will ask you. But we have only some minutes uh, some minutes left. So. Uh, at the end, I want to ask you about uh, your future perspectives and like from you, Simon, uh, uh, what can journalists, uh, what can journalists do, how journalists should behave. Yesterday there was uh, a discussion also organized by the Nauman Foundation with the director of uh, Reporters Without Borders who uh, said um, that, um, that journalists also have to take care have a special role in the uh, in the whole system so what you would uh, would uh, suggest to your colleagues well i mean journalists are doing a lot already um, with very meager resources so i feel like asking journalists to do even more uh, isn't very fair um, because it's a dangerous job nobody says thank you for it you only get criticized uh, and um, at the same time, it's extremely essential, like cleaning up the garbage on the streets. Um, so it's, it's a necessary job. And so, you know, my message would really be more to viewers um, and to uh, policymakers, which is that, um, you know, you've witnessed how society becomes dysfunctional um, when we don't have local journalism. Um, when, when we have uh, uh, media companies losing employment. So it's up to you guys to figure out a way of making sure our journalists have the resources and the support they need to be able to continue doing their job. And Mrs. Alt, what will be your comment on that and future perspectives? Uh, very important to uh, support uh, the, a lot of journalism um, in, in Russia, also uh, with uh, every um, foundation we have uh, in, in, um, in, in Russia. Uh, so I, I have mentioned um, also scholarships, um, internships, uh, support uh, by uh, Deutsche Welle. Um, uh, Deutsche Welle is very important um, because uh, Deutsche Welle provides um, uh, quality journalism in Russian. The Deutsche Welle, uh, Russian's new uh, YouTube channel, has almost half a million subscribers. Uh, this is uh, huge and this can become bigger. So it's, um, I can say, people, people in Russia uh, are not as stupid as Russian TV uh, wants them to be. Uh, they uh, value quality journalism when they get uh, access to it. Uh, so we, we have to uh, support um, 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 every young journalism. I, I know it's a very dangerous uh, job, uh, but um, we need um, independent journalism in, in the future. And um, uh, Simon mentioned uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, I think uh, Vladimir Putin will be uh, in power um, until 2036. And, uh, and uh, um, we need 
uh, a lot of support, international support uh, of uh, journalism, young journalism uh, in Russia. You know? I can, can imagine uh, it can be even more hard uh, in the Corona pandemic uh, because it's all related to money and um, yet yeah, to support all the projects and internships and uh, scholarships um, to protect also uh, the young generation of, um, of the journalists uh, in the United States, but also uh, in, uh, in Russia, as we discussed today. So unfortunately, our time is, uh, is almost over. Uh, thank you so much um, to the audience for staying with us and uh, to asking questions. Thank you so much, um, Simon Ostrovsky, um, being with us from New York, um, and Renata Alt from Kirchheim Tech. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, for sharing your experiences and, uh, um, and also your perspective, how, um, how to protect uh, media freedom, um, freedom of expression. So uh, thank you so much to the audience. See you next time. And I want to uh, invite you to the next event by the DJP. As I mentioned, it will um, be held on Friday on 4 p.m. with Dita Tetsche, the former CEO of Daimler and uh, Daniela Schwarzer. She's director of the German Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you so much for the Norman um, Foundation for the wonderful cooperation and uh, all the best to you. Thank you so much for having us. It was really great to be on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.